Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guest today is Lori Garver. Lori is a leading figure in the U.S. space program and frequent contributor to the public dialogue on national civil space policy. She was the deputy administrator at NASA from 2009 to 2013 under President Obama. She's also the founder of Earthrise Alliance, co-founder of Brooke Owens Fellowship, and an operating advisor at Bessemer Venture Partners. Her new book, Escaping Gravity, My Quest to Transform NASA and Launch a New Space Age, just came out. Laurie, welcome to the future of space. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you, Daniel. So glad that our path crossed at um, in Washington, D.C. at the National Space uh, Society Conference. Uh, first in real uh, person uh, post COVID, so that was uh, that was really wonderful. And congratulations for the award that you received that evening. Uh, that must have been uh, nice to be recognized by your peers. Thank you. Yes, I consider the National Space Society my family, as you know. So um, it was very special. Now, before we go into your book and all the wonderful stuff that you're working on, could you share with us three words that capture the essence of space for you? Sure. Um, I guess for me, they can be separate or they have meaning together. And that would be vast, infinite opportunity. So of course, space is vast. I think a lot of us are drawn to it because of, of just that if you want to do something big something that really infinite meaning we do not yet know what all is out there not that it goes on forever and ever that's a little more than i can wrap my head around but the opportunity to me is as um maybe you might have thought the trans transporting people across the ocean would have been um, for the first time we built ships, certainly a lot of analogies to early aviation. There's nothing but opportunity out there and we don't yet know all the things people will find that are of great value to do in space. I think it's always hard to imagine the future and what it will be at that time. I mean, you know, if we go back in the 1900s, when Tesla and Edison and the Wright brothers were creating this new vision of the world, a lot of people would have, I mean, even back then, a lot of people have said it was ridiculous trying to fly to, you know, to, to go to the sky. And it would have been easy to say to Edison or even Tesla is like, why waste so much time trying to power the world while we have other issues to take care of? But the vision, the world that they created actually elevated the world into a new place. And it would have been really hard for people to envision that future. And I think we're in that, that, that place today. Yes, I think we have technologies that gives us a glimpse of what that future can be. But we're totally, I think, unaware of, of how impactful that future is going to be. Would you agree? Yes, and luckily we have had people throughout history who have been able to envision something more. And those people have been really important throughout history. You named a few, and they had to stand up to the naysayers, and we're still doing that in space a little bit, but that's right. If you didn't have people really pushing to say, oh, maybe this could be something, um, we we wouldn't be as a civilization where we are today. Now, of course, good comes with bad. And we all know that lots of our inventions didn't always turn out to have everything be um, helpful over the longer term, which is, in my view, why we have to keep inventing. Now, besides the science story and the technology story um, of going to space, and there's a, a politic a political story also, uh, legislations and, and, and policy story of going to space. What do you think for you is the human story of going to space? Well, the human story for space, for going there, started long before we went. 
in my view, you know, with some of these visionaries, science fiction writers, for example, have been envisioning um, people and what life could be like in space and the things of value you might do there. Some of those early pioneers got some things wrong, but for the most part, we are on a path that follows their lead. I think the reasons to go to space for individuals are sort of as many as there are individuals. That's the point. And you, the political story for me of trying to help get the barriers to entry, increase the accessibility to space for people, for stuff, was the, was the goal because I know none of us know everything. And when we open up more minds, more eyes to the potential, they're going to come up with um, their own reasons to go personally, their own things to do there that are of value, their own solutions to even our problems here on Earth from space. So humanity, not everyone wants to go. You, you get this really interesting response when you ask people, would you go? But as a humanity, I think it's rare to find someone who believes we shouldn't be going. And I know not everyone even probably supported uh, Apollo and people don't necessarily support the government spending money sending humans, but humans going is something that um, most people accept is well, without it, we don't have much of a future as a species. You can disagree over the timeline of how long we could survive here on this planet, whether we're eventually going to either have a asteroid or a comet strike or a, you know, if we last long enough, our, our star burning out or going supernova, we, we need to get off the planet in a way that allows humanity to expand and survive elsewhere. And I think that is the ultimate human story. I think life has been waiting for this moment for 4.6 billion years, right? If it's if it started as a this single cell and then just evolved to become multi-cell and invested so much energy in developing life, ultimately it's because it wants to figure out how to come off and get off the planet and start spreading on the universal level in the same way that it has been spreading on Earth. And because it wants to survive and wants to continue. And the human species is really the ambassador. It embodies the, the best and the worst of life. We can engineer it as, as, as cruelty, but at the same time, we beautify and we exemplify this capacity to innovate and to every time that we, we reach a ceiling or, about, or, or limits, we figure out how to move beyond and forward. For me, I I'll, along that vein, have for a long time people say oh you know humans are you know an exploring species like well all species explore to survive and so you get really deep on this you think about humanity likely the first of life not humanity the first seeds of life likely came here from outer space and if we need to survive to go back that is a very natural quest Absolutely. Were you always interested in space? I mean, you you were at the National Space Society, and and then you ended up being, you know, with NASA um, on the policy level. But from the the little Laura um, Garver as a as a teenager, were you always looking up to the sky and saying, "I want to I want to have a career in the space uh, in the space industry." You know, my story is different than most people my age in the space community because I did not grow up that way. I was raised in mid-Michigan from a family that had, we were farmers. My dad became a stockbroker. I have no engineers or scientists, but my uncle and my grandfather, who were farmers, were um, state representatives elected by their, you know, fellow farmers to help better their neighbors and so forth. So I was discouraged from going into science and math, as were most girls my age back then. I was ready to take calculus my senior year. This is a story I have in the in the book in more detail, but they only sent the boys 
to the college calculus class, not thinking a girl had any reason to want to do that. And my undergraduate degrees, therefore, were in political science and economics. I really didn't start paying attention to space until they sent someone who looked like me. And that was Sally Ride in 1983. And it was the year I graduated from college. My first job was working for John Glenn, but I came to work for him because I thought he was our best chance at beating Ronald Reagan, who was running for president. It had nothing to do with space. So he was really my first entry and in, into space, and I got the job at the National Space Society after applying to be the secretary, bookkeeper, receptionist. And I really just needed to pay my rent. So no, I came to this wanting a career and a life that helped leave the planet and the people on it better than I found it. And right away at the National Space Society, I realized space was a beautiful way to do that, a very important way to do that. And I got a master's at night in space policy while working full time and moved on within the Space Society, becoming the executive director a few years later before my NASA career. So I'm one of those people who did not grow up saying I want to be an astronaut. My draw was, I think space has, you know, vast infinite opportunity. I really want to hear though, because you were saying your story and I do feel that for, you are someone similar to me who, I don't know if you grew up wanting to be an astronaut, but you definitely have had other interests. I did. I, I really did not grow up uh, with any desire of going to space. I've, I've never, I've, I've never thought that space was a, an accessible place. I've always thought of space as just this, you know, okay, it's this thing that is bigger than us, but you know, we'll, we'll have to figure out how to live on this planet because we're, we're, this is what we have. And in 2020, I had this, like, along with many other people, uh, be because of Elon Musk, I had this moment of realization that, wait a second, no, um, we're just at the scale of, we're at the same place than we were when we looked over on the ocean and realized, you know, oh, now we can go. We figured out how to make some boats and then we can go. And understanding that nature had been waiting for this moment for 4.6 billion years, that for me was my big my big turning point. And and I've, I've always, because I've spent a lot of time in nature, I've always understood nature's um, foundation of disruption and tension. It's always pushing the the, the boundaries of of um, of the environment, like. Every single species has a capacity to destroy their environment, but they're constrained by other species or by the limit of their own, you know, their own capacity. And the human is no different than that because it assures that that's how it assures evolution. You know, you, you eat everything that you eat, that, that you can eat. And then after that, you have to figure out how to get to that next, to that next meal. So bringing your environment to a point of stress is unfortunately part of that journey of transformation. And now that we've reached the capacity, or not the capacity, but a certain stress on the global scale, well, it gives us the incentive to push, you know, to push beyond. So for me, that was the that was a big tipping uh, tipping point, and discovering the spirit of the space community that is really about fixing the issues rather than trying to blame the human species, which is predominant in the environmental world. This narrative of like, we're bad people, we're bad species. If like, if we could take ourselves out of the equation, everything would be so wonderful on the planet. Um, so that for me was a big transition. And I, I'm really happy now to see that there are a lot more people that are not from the space and that not from the space, they're not from Star Trek. They're not, you know, the space geek but they're bringing something new to, uh, to the table. Uh, was that, I mean, is it, is it similar for you? 
Well, that's very fun for me. Mine, um, it's fun for me to have someone like you who came to this sort of post SpaceX and inspired by that, because as I worked to try and get that to happen, lots of the pushback, those people said, well, people won't care if it's not NASA. I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think they might. Um, mine was seeing the the um, cadre of astronauts expand beyond the early military white men. As the shuttle was starting, um, you had more people who I could relate to flying. And in talking to them when they returned, they had this epiphany about our planet and how we needed to work together because there aren't these lines between countries. And of course they talked about the thin atmosphere and so forth. This is from the beginning struck me as well, obviously there's no lines between countries. I have been a global citizen for my whole life. I really don't know why, but it just struck me as the important aspect of going to space as we turned around and we saw ourselves for the first time and we realized we're in this together. It's kind of the similar, I mean, as soon as you, you know, we all live in, in one house and the house is, the, you know, different rooms, obviously, but once you step out of that house, you look back and you realize, well, everybody's living on the same roof. Yes, there are divisions within that house, um, but we're all kind of manage to live with all these these separations or these these different personalities, and I think that the, I mean, from my perspective, often we do need to recognize that we have differences, but the human story is what really connects us all. And at at, at the bottom of it, we all want the same thing. We all want to be recognized, valued. We want to put food on the table, and we want to send our children to school and give them a future. Um, then after that, things get a little bit complicated, but the human story, I think this is the thing that people can all go back to and, and, and be united on. And when we go to space and we look and we see the, the planet in context of the space, then it kind of really brings it down to the essence of what it is to be alive and to be engaged in this, you know, in this big journey. Um, Laurie, you worked at NASA, which is recognized to be, you know, a lot of policies and it's a, it's a big machine, but you worked there at the time where there was a rising of entrepreneurial spirit and innovator, uh, innovation, uh, parallel to NASA. And you tried to, to, to move that boat. You had one foot in the in in the the breaking the the rules and one foot in the the old rules how hard was it to manage these two uh, different philosophies oh it, you know it i had to manage both you have to have bridges you know and to connect uh, sides and i was at nasa in the 1990s under an administrator dan golden who was, I thought, bridging those sides as well. He'd come early on, a NASA person who went to industry, and he felt that beyond the space shuttle, we would be tapping the private sector to really expand outward. And of course, the National Space Society had taught me that. Um, but I also was a part of the space industry in the in the sense that I had a NASA career. I worked in aerospace industry and came back as the head of the transition team for president-elect Obama. So I had industry people who I think at the time felt I would just carry their water um, and maybe forget all that early space pirate stuff. Um, and so they were disappointed that I was really trying new things with with NASA's policies for human space flight, especially. And I think that almost entirely had to do with the fact that their incentive was to keep doing what they're doing. That's all. They're not bad people. They're just, they're getting money to do something. And if all of a sudden other people are going to be allowed to compete at lower prices, 
that's a game changer. And in the book, I talk about it with a reference to Moneyball, Moneyball being a book and a movie about baseball. So it seems unlikely, but when Billy Bean, this Oakland A's general manager, um, tried to make some changes to baseball to make it a, a you able to do recruiting in a more effective way, the rest of the baseball community hated him for it. And there's a scene in the movie that I've watched uh, dozens of times because they say the first one through the wall always gets bloody. People do not want to change. And when you are driving change in something, whether it's business or government, um, there, the people are going to fight you on the other side. And this quote is they go bat shit crazy. And there, there were people who went bat shit crazy over these changes. And to a large extent, um, I think people see the value of what we were doing now, but it is still a battle because these are billion dollar contracts and it's a very challenging arena. So we've got still a lot of people concerned on that side of it because I'm not an engineer, because I, my goal wasn't to personally go to space. I just took the bigger picture and said, you know, we need it all. Actually, we need um, big aerospace and we need innovation. Um, lots of analogies when, you know, Steve Jobs um, and Bill Gates began to innovate in computers. IBM didn't go away. They didn't like it, but they got better and they had to, to survive. Yeah, change is always inherently challenging. I mean, even in nature, it's, the, the the default mode is actually not wanting to change because you have to spend energy. The life or the energy is always trying to get from point A to point B in the least amount of energy. And change demands that you invest in disrupting the stability that you've created so that you can try something new, the possibility of something new, and you don't know if it's going to work or not. So change, and, and this it's I think it's one thing that people... Um, forget about about that reality it it takes time it's hard and that that initial person or group or factor that's going to create that change would not always be also the the right candidate to continue that change that's i mean often we see these entrepreneurs that are really great at starting a company but then once that company has a certain stability, they're not the right person because they're, they're more of these characters that excel in disrupting the status quo, pushing the boundaries. But then after that, you need to, you know, you need to, to, to maneuver the boat in a different way. Um, and I'm pretty sure now that you're able to recognize, looking back at NASA, how much of the, the impact that you were able to create and how Na NASA today is different because of you. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that, that um, you recognize that, right? I do, I do recognize it. It's, you know, it's, it's, there's just so many people who were required to, to have it happen and the ideas didn't start with me and if the right people hadn't been there to implement it, if SpaceX hadn't been there, it wouldn't have happened. But I definitely do, um, acknowledge I, I had a, a key role. I played a key role at a time when they needed someone in the position where I was to have that view, mainly because the people around me didn't share it. And especially the head of NASA and, you know, Bill Nelson, who's now the head of NASA, and they, these people are now on board and they're at least Charlie Bolden, a former head of NASA, is open about not believing in it in the beginning. My my little tweak there is, well, if I hadn't been there to fight sort of around you to get it, there wouldn't have been anything to come around to. <laughs> so it's great you came around to it. But in the book, I have a, a, a pretty rough analogy for that about uh, um, being a 
lifeguard and maybe waiting till someone's in shallow water to try and save them. Laurie, so before we, we go deeper into your book, could you share with us um, about Earthrise Alliance that you that you founded and what exactly um, is the company trying to do or to achieve? Sure. And in 2019, um, a, a family philanthropy reached out to me. They were interested in seeing how space could address climate change better. And I founded Earthrise, named after that first famous photo photograph from the far side of the moon looking at Earth, which is often credited to starting the environmental movement. Um, and reached out to work with some former NASA uh, people who are my, as I refer to them as the geniuses, who utilize, they take the data from satellite, primarily imagery, but combined with a lot of different um, spectrum sensors now, and are able to take that data and put into information that has an impact. So for instance, we are now mapping greenhouse gas emissions in near real time globally from this data. And we got that information to envoy Kerry before he was going to China to talk about their climate negotiations to show you cannot hide anymore. Space is a wonderful place where we can have regular, timed, known data about certainly what's happening to our planet, around 80% of what we are experiencing in climate change is we only know because of satellites where you can calibrate what's happening in each different place on on the ground but it's the interactions of the atmosphere the ice the water and the land that nasa models that is really allowing us to understand and therefore you know hopefully impact positively how um we manage our environment. So Earthrise is a project of philanthropy where we are just maximizing the value of satellite data to address climate change in, in every way we we can. Now, I'm pretty sure that um, with your company, you had plenty of work to do. So what led you to uh, to take the time to write a book? Because writing a book is quite a, a, a commitment. Um, was that an idea that you've always had ever since uh, leaving NASA or your envir environment, the people around you were telling you that you had a, an important story to tell? It's a combination of those things. When I left NASA in 2013, I knew I had experienced something that was not well understood and was important. Lots of journalists and writers wanted my notes um, so that they could write it up. And I've collaborated really with anyone who, who asks and wants to be interviewed. I was a public servant and I feel very strongly that that is giving back. The transparency of, of our government is really important and NASA is not a military organization. So everything should be public. Not, not that everyone wants all their stories told, but um, I had the intent when I left NASA to keep my notes, I made outlines, but I didn't make much progress. I was very busy and then um, COVID happened. And really, I don't think without COVID, I would have written this book. I was not traveling, which had taken a huge amount of my time. I initially committed to spending my commute time on, on the book. And I ultimately found that I, I, we also are fairly recent empty nesters that I could spend my time doing it efficiently. But it did take a couple of years and I had started it before COVID, but I was committed to doing it because there hasn't been a lot of knowledge inside, from inside the agency at, at the level where I was. Those people don't write books. Um, I'm one of the first women up there. Maybe that has something to do with it. But I I just feel this is a story that has to be 
told. I've had an amazing career and a bunch of interesting things happen to me that there's a lot of confusion about. And so it is a memoir from my perspective. So there's people going to say, oh, I don't agree. But I, um, I'm trying to be very open about that, you know, this is what happened from my perspective. And I came to NASA, unlike most people, um, without um, really a view that we needed to do things in a certain way, like build a big rocket. A lot of people come who, you know, your hammer and you, everything looks like a nail. And my perspective, I sort of equate it to the perspective we have from space is big picture. I mean, don't ask me to build a rocket. I'm going to not be able to do that. But I had learned how to address public value um, through space policies that we hadn't been doing correctly for decades. Not that I want to say that, you know, COVID in general was a good thing, but if there's one thing good that came out of this, these two and a half years was is definitely your book. And I think the world is going to be better. Be, I mean, the, the, the space narrative and the dialogue, the conversation is definitely going to be better because of the book that you've written. Was there any unexpected discovery that you experienced through writing the book? You know, I researched um, along along the way, even though I had my own notes, and I uncovered a resource that I was unaware of, which ended up being a treasure trove of information. Um, and it was the Johnson Space Center, NASA's big space center in Houston, has this thing they call oral histories. And a contractor does it, and they interview people and record them verbatim and post them online. And lots of people had comments about me in their oral histories. Um, lots of people say things in their oral histories that I suspected, but now learned for sure that they felt. Um, and I have I have downloaded and saved some of those because I fear when the book comes out, they're going to be quickly trying to get those off the web. But the truth is, as I said, I mean, this is a public agency and people should know this, but that for many people helped me gain an insight into what they were thinking. They're, they're speaking and being interviewed about the very, the same meetings I was in. And now I, I got to see their perspective. And so I pulled that into the book quite a bit. And what is the big message of the book? I mean, escaping gravity and obviously your time of, trans, of, of trying to implement change and create a new vision and new direction of NASA. But beyond that, what is the, the essence of your, of your, of your book? Even, even though I intended to write it in 2013, it is different because of when I wrote it. Now that we are seeing um, the success of, of just a minor, really, shift in how we go about, in the government, asking for the private sector assistance in achieving things, I feel there is a message that says, if we can do this, imagine what else we can do. And so my conclusion is called The Value Proposition, the last chapter, and It really talks about the other things that we do in government that could be of greater value. And you said it earlier in this interview. We all sort of have the same purpose. We all want to have um, food and shelter and health for ourselves and our families. And the, the point is, if you keep that end state in mind, we can hopefully start to agree to some more things along the way that make sense. And we have more in common than we have that divides us. And I, I do conclude with this upbeat message of we are very lucky to live in a time when not only do we have instantaneous communication, we have the ability to assure our future and understand that. We talk about the analogies of when you explore, we first explored um, beyond our shores, 
But now we know more about where we're going. We have telescopes. We have people who've been to the moon and we can share that information with everyone on the planet. And so if like me, you believe like not every one of us knows everything, that's what we need. We, we need this sort of network of, of people looking at this and coming up with their own things that we can do to benefit humanity. And I, I, I think, of course, escaping gravity is launching things off the planet, but it is also escaping the gravity of our situation. And the whole reason we were able to do something very hard, which is to launch things on rockets off the planet, is because we had an aligned goal. Everybody knows how you beat gravity. You're all working toward the same thing. And in my career, when people are rowing in the same direction, working towards the same thing, that's when you get the accomplishments. And, and so I'm hoping to inspire and have people see there are more things we can accomplish if we sort of a, agree that the basic principles that we all have are very similar. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's incredible thinking, I mean, you read about these, um, these journey of exploration, um, Shackleton, or even back in the days where um, the British Antarctic Society uh, survey would like send people with almost no knowledge and the hardship, the, 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 the experience just for the quest of knowledge is just mind blowing how far they would, they would go and suffer just to get this information. And now we have helicopter, we have a helicopter on Mars. We have robots on Mars. Um, I've, I've written now how the human cost of exploration, not has not disappeared, but it will not be what it's been because now we can we can learn about new places. We're not going blindly. I mean, even when there was the the big European migration, people would give up their lives, get on the boat with little knowledge of what it takes to survive. You know, we didn't know about the the deficiency of of, of the sun or food. They would get on this expedition with an uncertain uh, future, get like across to this place that they had no idea, get on the caravan and then cross without nothing, almost no knowledge. But now we have the capacity to go beyond and to carefully step forward so that, you know, we don't do things in, in the useless and, and, and spend a lot of energy. So I think, I think this new era of exploration scientific exploration, but also, I mean, the, the, the planetary exploration is just going to be um, super um, inspiring and fun because we can we can do it in a way that that is less um, costly for us, right? Yes, and, and we can go along with each other. Uh, when people used to leave, no one knew what happened to them. <laughs> Absolutely, we're bringing the story, and then we're 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 keeping that connection. Um, I mean, at, you know, when the people are going to go to the moon or to Mars, there's going to be this constant connection um, with that story, with that expedition. And not, you know, it's not like back in the days we we're uh, setting out and explore the, these new oceans, and then you would disappear for three years. And then you would lose half of your crew. And then after that, you would come back and people would have forgotten you or your kids, you know, have, have, have grown up and they're totally estranged to who you are. So the, that human story now is really more connected because of our capacity to stay connected. And that is uh, much of that is because we have a space program. Absolutely. Laurie, the book just came out. Are you going to go on a big book tour and now that we're post COVID, then we can do things in, in person. Are you looking forward to get back on the road and, and share that story with the world? You know, we are doing at this point, a lot of places where there's already an event, like I'm planning to go to new space in Seattle in August. I will certainly go to Michigan, Ohio, um, New York. We will have, 
perhaps things in um, space cities like Houston. Um, but right now, I think bookstores are still coming out with hybrid or in person and no one is exactly sure. But I am excited as I start now and talking to so many people about um, this vision and seeing who all wants to, uh, you know, who you put something out there and people are going to take from it different things. So yes, I am. I'm very much looking forward to being in person and talking about it as much as possible. Now there's, there's going to be the audiobook. There's a hardcover coming out. And then if people want to see, uh, want to connect with you, they can go through the LinkedIn and um, the book page. Laurie, any words of wisdom for the young audience, for these young women that are, that are, or for anyone who's looking to be part of this new future, even though they're not engineers or they're not scientists, um, but they, they want to be part of, of shaping the, the future. What would, what would be your words of wisdom? Yeah, so that is the, Another reason to tell my story is because I was a very unlikely uh, person to grow up to have the career I did. And my point is that anyone really can play a pivotal role in whether it's space or another arena um, because really science, we all know, is strengthened by diversity any group is strengthened by diversity and there's nothing better than getting new ideas. I think one of the things I talk about in the book is we really have been a little stuck partly because the very people who were inspired by the early stuff we did in space went into the field and then their whole thing is that they're inspired by the same thing. So it's like a, you know, self feeding loop. And in order to break out of that, different people being involved, people like yourself. I, I learned this. I came by it honestly because the National Space Society were people from all backgrounds and interests, people who were lawyers, photographers, um, certainly many technical people as well who had a different idea about how we might go about doing this. And it was the combination of those ideas that is really exciting. So to me, it's, yeah, we joke the old line, you know, these shoes don't shine themselves. These rockets don't build themselves. It's all people. And what you can think of to do, you, you can find a way to do. And today our tools are even much, much um, better than what I had. But my advice is, is still the same. Early in my career, it was always, you know, show up. You are not missed by your absence. Be there. Join everything. I joined every group. I was the president of women in aerospace in 1992. You know, I mean, they would have me, so I did it. Um, and they then, you know, I I had my first child that year, and um, it became a thing because, oh, my gosh, there aren't many women in space, much less pregnant women in space. <laughs> and, and the more people, I think, are aware that you bring a different perspective. I think today we are, we are much more open to that. That's why I founded the Brooke Owens Fellowship and now the Patty Gray Smith Fellowship, um, Matt Isaacowitz Fellowship. Get those early career people who have ideas that we haven't thought of. They, it's, it's so exciting. The most exciting thing in my whole career has been learning from others and my skill is more in putting together those thoughts and people in a way that adds value. I'm not the originator of these ideas, and I'm certainly not the technical mind to make it happen. So we need everybody. Diversity is actually a strategy from nature to assure continuity of life. That's how, like, if all the eggs were in the same basket, it just takes one strategy, you know, tragedy. Diversity, having multiple... Um, actors that just constantly you know partner and feed of each other it's it's a strategy of survival it's a strategy from nature we're not trying to 
reinvent the wheel or do something that is unnatural. It's actually natural. And the, 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 the need for two different energies to make life, you know, if life was really happy just to create, you know, that make do it your own, then that would be something. But the reality is that it takes, it takes two to make life. So it takes two, we, we bring different, um, different, different things to the table, which makes life so much richer and diverse and, and, and the experience is so much better. And I'm, and I'm looking forward as now we go to space and we bring the human experience because so far space has been more of a, of a, of a technology achievement. We're trying to, it, but it's rough camping, right? We're going, it's like, okay, we can go over there, but we're roughing it. Food is awful. And it's, and it's, and it's really not for everyone, but bringing the human experience, bringing the people that are not necessarily the engineers or don't want to rough it, in, but they want to bring that human experience. That for me is that new era that we're entering. That's going to be so captivating. And I'm sure that your book is going to be leading, <laughs> leading that march. Laurie, thank you so very much for sharing uh, your time and your, 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 your book with us. And I'm looking forward to uh, to share with the world. You are welcome. It was wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. We'll make sure that we have all the links in the descriptions um, and the links to your book and to your audiobook. And for people, I know that you're super active on Twitter, so we'll put that too, so people can follow uh, where you're going to be and if you're going to be in their in their neighborhood, they can come and see you. So, Laurie, until our path cross again. Wishing you all the best. You too, Daniel. Thank you.